Welcome everybody. I am not Sean Lossman. You are aware of that. Sean is at home recovering from recent surgery, so we wish him well. And I am in his stead announcing our Edna Anderson Taylor Institute lecture for today with Dr. Brandon Valeriano. This is a real treat. Dr. Valeriano has an extremely impressive resume. I will hit the highlights here for you. He currently serves as a distinguished senior fellow at the Marine Corps University and senior advisor to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission 2.0. He was most recently the Donald Bren Chair of Military Innovation at the Marine Corps University's Brut Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare. His research takes a quantitative social science approach to the study of cybersecurity and military strategy, and he is a co-creator of the Dyadic Cyber Incident Dataset, one of the first comprehensive and open datasets of cyber conflict incidents. He has published numerous peer-reviewed journal articles and co-authored two books on these topics, both with Oxford University Press. He also currently serves as the area editor for international relations and strategy for the Journal of Cybersecurity and as general editor of the Oxford University Press book series on disruptive technology and international security. Dr. Valeriano has testified before the US Congress as well as the UK and Canadian parliaments on cybersecurity issues. He served as a senior advisor to the original Cyberspace Solarium Commission, a congressional commission that has taken the lead in formulating cybersecurity strategy and legislative agendas for the United States. That's really remarkable. Since earning his PhD in political science from Vanderbilt University, Dr. Valeriano has also written peer-reviewed articles, opinion pieces, and books on a range of other issues in international security, including soccer, diversity, and K-pop. Are we going to hear anything about K-pop? I would love to talk about K-pop. We'll work that into the Q&A. All right. Please. <laughs> K-drama, K-pop, J-pop, it's all fair game. All right. One quick note before I hand over the floor to Dr. Valeriano. Uh, please plan to join us on April 10th at 3 p.m. for presentations and a panel discussion with members of our local refugee community about the challenges they face telling their stories and the challenges and opportunities that we face in helping them to do so. This event was organized by our colleague, Dr. Suhi Choi, and will feature opening remarks from Ash Parekh, who is the Director of Refugee Services uh, for the Department of Utah Workforce Services. That will be held in the new Com Institute space, which you've seen under development, and I think that will be the first thing that happens in that space. So, second thing that happens in that space. Well, it'll be the most interesting <laughs> early event <laughs> in that space. Uh, with all that said, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Brendan Valeriano. I need to edit my bio because that's better than I think my bio is. And yes, I am so important. On Monday, I gave testimony in the Canadian Senate. I took a picture with the convener of the session. And I sent it to my friend and he said, who's that? And I said, I don't know, it's Canada, like the king of the Canadian Senate. I don't, I don't know how this works. So it was, it, it was Gene Guy. Still don't know who that is, but you know, I do what I do. Um, uh, Sean has been wanting to have me out for a while. Unfortunately, he cannot be here today. Uh, I should open up Signal and just beam the entire talk to him. So. Uh, uh, but uh, he's been pretty invested in this paper for a long time, too, and pushing me to get it out. Unfortunately, I've been interviewing and doing all these other things for the last few months, so I haven't had a chance to get it out. But luckily, it's still very, very relevant and still kind of top-of-the-line research for what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, I hope I can be entertaining. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad I'm here because I spent last night in Phoenix, as you do. Um, you know, Connection di didn't make it. Uh, my bag ended up in San Jose because the, air, the airport code for Salt Lake City and San Jose and Santiago, Chile are apparently well alike enough that this happens frequently. So this is the best. This is all the clothes I have right now, actually. So this is the best I can, the best presentable I can be. Um, I got up at six. So, um, and like I said, I was in Ottawa on Monday. I got back on Tuesday. 
I had an all-day interview at an Ivy League on Wednesday, and I jumped on a plane to get here on, at 5 o'clock on Wednesday, and I barely got here at 12. Um, on top of that, I had a very good burrito for lunch. I'm, I have to commend the Salt Lake City uh, basic burrito. Didn't do any research. It was a lot better than any D.C. Uh, burrito. But that being said, all this is going on in my life. And uh, I hope this is a normal talk, but I can pretty much assure you this is not going to be a normal talk, given the context of everything. Uh, I am happy to talk about K-drama, K-pop, the K-wave, actually, because that excites me a lot more than uh, uh, cyber warfare. Um, and the reason why is things have gotten grossly out of control in the discourse on cyber warfare. Uh, people take this hype-based perspective, and a lot of it comes from popular culture, and they make that the reality. And because of that, that's why I like to keep up with pop culture. The K-pop thing is a whole other issue. I had a heart issue and I came out afterwards. You know how some people have that uh, the accent syndrome where they have like weird accents after they have... Uh, I didn't like my normal music anymore, so I just started liking K-pop and J-pop. I, I, it's, it's like I had an Indian accent all of a sudden. And uh, I, I don't know, I just went with it. But... Um, in terms of popular culture, it pretty much dictates a lot of how people view cybersecurity. And uh, I have a picture here, Thunder Run, Global Warfare. It's a game, a tank-based game. There is this idea that Thunder Run strategies are going to be predominant in military maneuver. Uh, Thunder Run, as an idea, was developed in Vietnam to kind of blow past North Vietnamese landmines and just kind of use armor to, in mass to avoid uh, landmines. Um, we also use Thunder Run strategies in Iraq um, in urban battles. And uh, cyber scholars are contending we're using Thunder Run strategies in Ukraine. Or Russia is using Thunder Run strategies in Ukraine. So these two guys, Cartler and Black, they're researchers for NATO. They said, um, Russian cyber attacks on government, military command and control centers, logistics, emergency services, and other critical services, such as border control stations, were entirely consistent with a full called Thunder Run strategy intended to stow chaos, confusion, uncertainty, and ultimately avoid a costly and protracted war with Ukraine. They wrote this in March after the war started. They also wrote that Russia's most successful aspect of the war is their cybersecurity strategy. I don't know what war they're watching. I don't know what they're observing. But it's entirely ridiculous to say things like this and to have national news media pick this up and take this as the truth. And in some ways, this is why I get along so well with Sean, because a lot of what we do in cybersecurity has very much become communications. It's very, become, it's very much become PR and sort of predicting where the future may be without a tether to empirical reality. Other pundits and academics said that the war would start with a shock and awe. Uh, they also said there would be a cyber thunder run enabled by cyber. Uh, Jason Healy uh, at Columbia University um, said, a Russian invasion of Ukraine may redefine how we think about cyber conflict because it will be the first time a state with real cyber capabilities is willing to take risks and put it all on the line. The weird thing is, is that a lot of people have been waiting, expecting, believing that the future of war will be dictated by cybersecurity operations. Um, I don't know where they get this idea. I teach at the U.S. military. I teach joint and combined operations. Uh, we plan for cyber operations joint with conventional operations. But the reality of leveraging these operations during combat is far from action at this point. It's all theory. It's not reality. But a lot of people in the field believe this is reality. They believe this is happening. 
And this paper, in some ways, is a way to quash that sort of vision. We review the war at its six-month mark, examining the impact of cyber operations in the course of the Russia-Ukrainian war, exploring the severity of operations, examining the style and purpose of attacks. And this is critical because this debate speaks to core theories about the future of war and the power of emergent technology. And I think there's this dramatic challenge in how people think about the future. And people think about the future in this kind of fantastical vision of how war is going to happen with sound blast and lasers and anti-satellite conflict. And the reality is much different. Um, sad to say, but Ukraine has been a return to the old. Frontal mass assaults, trench warfare, massive artillery barrages, attacks on the civilian population, a uh, massive refugee movement, if not outright stealing Ukrainian children and moving them to Russia. These are the strategies of the past. An emergent technology, whether that be cyber or AI or quantum or drones or satellite surveillance, it hasn't changed war yet. I'm not so sure it will, but that's an open academic question for everyone in this room. So to outline the talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about cyber strategies and different cyber options, talk about Russia's past cyber profile, what they've done in the past, expectations about the Russia-Ukrainian war, the research methods, our results, and a little discussion. And I do love that picture of the, the, the Ukrainian uh, tractor just pulling that, that Russian cruiser that they took out. Um, and, and it goes to show that low-tech solutions have been the run of play in the war in Ukraine. And this defies predictions. This defies what people expected. Um, so cyber strategies. I wrote a book in 2015 where we kind of made a typology of cyber strategies and uh, we delineate between disruption, which is basically harassment, espionage, which is intelligence and information warfare, and degradation, which seeks to harm or destroy critical infrastructure or kill human beings. Um, the thing is, is that you have to be careful because quite often we lump certain social outcomes in total all together as if they're the same. There are different types of cyber operations. There's different types and methods of cyber operations and developing a typology I think is very critically important in understanding how cyber conflict works in modern day reality. The other thing I will say is that it's entirely possible to empirically examine cyber operations. I was told throughout my career it's impossible, you can't measure cyber operations, they're secret, they're covert, they happen below the threshold of conflict, therefore we will never know them. I would contend actually that cyber conflict is one of the most public forms of conflict we have because the act of attacking a adversary network computer is a very, very public act. Whether or not you catch the perpetrators or catch the action or know you've been hacked is a different question. But quite often, the most dominant form of international aggression is actually this form of cyber conflict where one state attacks another state in cyberspace. The problem, though, is that it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. It's not coercive, as we say. It doesn't change the bounds of political discourse quite often. I would distinguish, though, between cyber and information operations. I think information operations are the future. I think, in many ways, uh, cyber operations were called information warfare before 9-11. A lot of people moved and changed fields over time. And I would really like us to go back to thinking about information warfare, not cyber warfare. But when we make it about computers, digital interactions, bytes, and things like that, um, it becomes very tough to comprehend for the layperson. It's very tough for people to understand how this would work in reality. And because it's so difficult to understand, we often take the government and the intelligence services at face value. 
Uh, and I can tell you they have no idea what they're doing. They are absolutely, utterly lost, if not quite often making up results as they go along. And this is confirmed time and time again when I interact with policymakers and people in the military. It's tough. The reality is not as clean as people make it out to be. Anyways, Russia's cyber profile. What has Russia been doing in the past from 2000 to 2020? Based on the data set that we've collected, there are 30 incidents between Russia and Ukraine from 2000 to 2020. Russia is frequently the initiator. They're rarely the target. So they're mainly the aggressor. They're the perpetrator. Most of the incidents are launched for disruptive and espionage purposes. They're more of a nuisance than degrading. There have been a few attacks to take out critical infrastructure in Ukraine, particularly the sandworm attacks. Uh, but those attacks were actually thwarted quite quickly and um, Jurassic Park style, they went to the breakers and they switched the power on and off and it was fine. Uh, Wired has, you know, 2,000 word articles about the impact of these operations. They happen at three o'clock at night. You know, you lose your power at night. Sometimes you wake up and you're like, oh, I lost my power at night. That's exactly what happened in Ukraine. But for a lot of people, this was a dramatic incident in geopolitical affairs. Um, cyber incidents in this context are often not very severe and they have never resulted in a concession by Ukraine, meaning they're not coercive. They haven't gotten Ukraine to change their behavior. And often that's what we're here for. We're here for politics. We're here to understand the impact of communication. And if there is no impact on the target, I, I really don't know why a lot of this discourse has become so popular and consequential. Um, private sector actors and government local authorities are more frequently targeted than the military. Nearly one third of the incidents from 2000 to 2020 sought to manipulate uh, communication and digital information. So these were information operations. Um, so a lot of Russian cyber operations are directly connected to information operations. So keep that in mind, that'll come up in a minute. What did we do? Where did we get our data from? The SSCIP, I forget what the acronym stands for, it's a long Ukrainian term, uh, but they were the cyber operators managing the Ukrainian defense. From March to May 15th of 2022, uh, they released weekly reports. Why did they release weekly reports? Because they wanted help. They were being invaded. They wanted support from the international environment. They wanted support from partners. And they were basically crying out in the night for support. These reports are very insightful in that they detail all the cyber operations launched by Russia against Ukraine. It's also interesting for us because, as we stated, I made a cyber incident data set as peer-reviewed, but I use an entirely different method of triangulating cyber incidents through the news media and then identifying uh, technical reports that back up those news media reports. So we would circulate around those technical reports, and that's how we code cyber incidents. Here, I'm just using what Ukraine is telling us. Why? Because it makes it a very tough test against me because I basically become known as the cyber skeptic, the person saying there is no cyber warfare. Well, if you were to find cyber warfare and someone were to cry that they were under cyber attack and there's a lot of impactful operations, it would be Ukraine during this period early in the war. The other one is Microsoft. They released two detailed reports, one in April and one in June, where basically uh, Microsoft had a main character syndrome. They, um, they did a lot of support for Ukraine. They helped Ukraine. They were consequential in the war. But they also wrote a report basically saying, look at me, we're saving Ukraine. That's good for us because they identified a lot of incidents and a lot of attacks. So through these reports, through this different method, we were able to identify 47 cyber incidents from November of 2021 to May of 2022. In May uh, 15th, the last report, they stopped releasing weekly reports because there, you know, as I'll point out, there really was nothing there. Um, they were asking for support and it wasn't really evident they actually needed support in the cyber domain because Russia wasn't very effective. 
So they stopped being so detailed and they started releasing general reports and they started also to tie in drone attacks and those Iranian waves of drone attacks and information operations with cyber operations because the cyber side wasn't really telling the story they wanted. I'm going to skip that hypothesis because we don't need that right now. Um, so the data. Uh, from 2000-2013, the pre-war phase, there were only three incidents between Ukraine and Russia. 2014 to 2020, there were 25. In 2022 alone, there were 47. So there was a dramatic uptick. There was also almost a doubling of attacks. Problem is, if you look at severity, and we have a severity score out of 10, from 2014 to 2020, the average severity is 3.24. In 2022, the average severity is only 2.45. So while the number of attacks almost doubled, the severity of the attacks as we code them out, on, uh, out of a 10-point scale actually declines. You can see that here. In 2020, 2000 to 2020, you see an uptick around the war uh, in Crimea in 2014. And actually, when they start to do the critical infrastructure attacks, in 2015, 2016, and 2017, you see the highest stage. They were about out of five then. 2022, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, we all have smartwatches now. That looks like my EKG meter when I'm late for something and trying to get somewhere. It's just, it's out of control. There's no clear pattern. There's no clear regression. It just shows that there is no clarity to the severity there are like five incidents that are out of five but there are many more incidents that are only out of two the average is probably between three and two as i've said so it just shows that uh, the pattern isn't exactly as evident as people might expect it to be the other thing is you know if during war you would expect to see a change in type of operations before the war uh 28% of the operations were degrade, majority of operations were espionage at 46%, and disruption was 25% of the operations. Remember, disruption is harassment, degrade is the most serious, espionage is for information and intelligence. During the war, it does change, but what changes is there is less espionage operations and more disruption operations. Surprisingly, you actually see less degrade operations. So less operations to destroy, harm, or degrade the capability of the Ukrainian government and military. You would not expect to see that during the ferocity of the 2022 war that sadly I think will continue for a long time. Targets. You would expect to see a dramatic change in targets during the war. Before the war, 10% of the targets were government military targets. 32% were government non-military, and 57% were private sector. During the war, it doesn't change. If anything, government uh, military targets actually drops a little bit. And I have all this done with statistical significance and t-tests and things like that. Uh, that. That will be for academic publication, but it's just not exactly relevant here. But suffice to say that these are statistically significant given the, the small population sizes that we're talking about. Now, in Microsoft's attempt to become the main character actor in the story here, they promoted this idea that there was dramatic coordination between cyber operators and conventional conflict in Ukraine. And they added this, this, this idea that the two things were linked. Weirdly enough, though, if you read the details of the Microsoft report, you can only identify six to seven coordinated incidents. And they never tell you the denominator. They never tell you how, of how many. We, we found seven out of 47. So it's 15%. I'm not saying it's insignificant. It is there. But if you were to say coordination, or what we say here is multi-domain operations, operations that happen in a conventional and cyberspace at the same time, at the same location in the same region, there's just not a lot of it. Uh, early on, I was part of this idea, part of this theory that cyber would be a complement to conventional operations, that cyber would be part of how we fight wars. It's just not. We can talk about why. 
but the main reason is that there are no assured cyber effects. You're a major planning a cyber offensive operation, your career is on the line, a general's waiting for your decision, and you tell him that you're gonna destroy this Ukrainian command and control facility through a cyber attack, and that cyber attack doesn't work, your career is now on the line. There's a reason why we don't depend on cyber operations for conventional military operations, and that's because of the dynamics of cyber operations and they are not assured. There is a very low probability that they will work. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use them. It doesn't mean the United States won't leverage them during war. But it does mean that Russia has been entirely ineffective and it's unlikely that you want to depend on these operations during war because they're unlikely to be effective. Information operations, I mentioned before that about one third of Russian operations had ties to information operations. And one of the big strategies for the Russians was hack and leak operations. Uh, they do that quite consistently with the United States. They hack into something, they link a bunch of emails, they insert a little, uh, you know, a, a, a little counterfeit information here and there. During the war, we actually saw a decrease that only 19% of the 47 incidents had a connection to information operations. So even where Russia is thought to be best, which is information operations and reflexive measures, we don't see evidence of this even being in action, let alone being effective. Uh, this is for a, uh, a journal. But, uh, you know, it's just basically the point being that there is a path to escalation in cyberspace. There is a path where cyber operations could lead to conventional escalation and possibly lead to the outbreak of war. That path is very, very rare. Under this analysis, it's about eight cases out of 560. So you can say there's a path, you can say there's a chance, but in reality, that chance is very, very slim. A lot of U.S. policymakers talk about, to this day, that because we're aiding Ukraine in this conflict, we're going to be cyber attacked by Russia. Actually, we've found less cyber attacks from Russia directed at the United States during this conflict than before. We had solar winds before. We had almost yearly attacks by Russia on the United States. Russia's been distracted. They've been busy. There is no cyber escalation. Uh, escalation technically is either vertical or horizontal, meaning it spreads to other allies and partners or the target, or intensity increases. We've seen neither here. So overall that we find uh, that while there's an increase in cyber operations during the war, we don't observe an increase in concessions, we don't observe an increase in severity, we don't observe a difference in targets or even methods of access. There are a lot of reports saying that actually Russia is using the cheapest, worst malware that they have. They're not bringing their best. Uh, another good example is the Colonial Pipeline incident. Uh, they took down uh, energy distribution for gas on the East Coast before the war in 2020, I believe it was. People were putting gas in gas bags and things like that. Things got crazy. That was done by a Russian criminal ransomware group. They caused so many problems for Putin that Putin arrested them, put that arrest on the internet, smashed down the doors, put the people out in handcuffs. Those people are still in jail. They were not released to help the Russian war effort. So it just goes to show that Russia is not using cyber for effect during this war. We also find little evidence of coordination between cyber operations and conventional operations in the form of multi-domain operations. So even this idea of complementary uh, cyber operations to support conventional operations, it's just not there. If anything, we think it's a distraction, like they will cyber attack a um, nuclear power plant or a media facility and they'll bomb it later but it doesn't mean they expect the cyber attack to work, so they're just like, well, we're gonna bomb it now. It's just distractions, mostly. Uh, will there be further escalation? It's possible. I'm not gonna rule it out, but it's very, very unlikely. And 
there's a kind of uh, sky is falling aspect to this where the U.S. government keeps saying that escalation is going to happen and escalation is possible and that it doesn't happen for years and years and years. We've been calling for Cyber 9-11, which, I don't know, Mike, when did Cyber 9-11 start? 1997? Yeah, it's, we've been talking about this Cyber 9-11, Cyber Pearl Harbor, Cyber Hiroshima for longer than I assume you guys have been alive. Um, not happened. Um, it might spread to other states. Uh, we know that, uh, <laughs> we know that there have been some attacks in Latvia and Lithuania, but that's not exactly the promise of horizontal conflict and horizontal escalation that people have been suggesting. Um, the central fact remains that cyber operations do not dramatically aid in the undertaking of military, diplomatic, or espionage operations in the context of war. Those offering uh, this idea of massive transformation or revolution brought on by cyber uh, conflict must confront evidence and reality, not motivated reasoning. And I think one of the things I'm most angry about is that... I've been playing in DC for six years. I'm done. I'm tired. There are just too many liars and there are no consequences. You can say whatever you want. You can be wrong. You can say we're going to war against China next year. We need to prepare. We need 500 ships. It doesn't happen. Oh, I thought it was going to happen. Seemed like a good idea at the time. That's kind of the logic that's going on right now and it's pretty discouraging as an academic. The cause, though. I didn't go into causes at all. And I'm not sure you can just yet. I think that's something for the future. That's something for you guys to do like different papers on and different investigations on. That's something for you to do if you end up working at the NSA, you know, in five years and you're going to go back and try and figure out why did all this happen? And you'll read articles in foreign policy of the Economist, and they'll say it was because of this, it was because of that. Reality: If this is social relations, all social relations are multicausal. There's a lot of reasons why these things happened. One could be that the defense is ascendant, and a lot of people got things wrong about this idea about the offense being ascendant. Uh, the other, of course, is the U.S. has aided Ukraine in their cyber defenses. The other is partner and ally support. Estonia has been very critical. Germany has been very critical, even Israel. Or it could be that Russia just sucks. Russia just sucks at war. You know, this is the thing we have to talk about. And we have to admit that a lot of people have been trumping up this idea of Russia as a pacing threat, and that never materialized and never worked out the way it did. They lost 134 vehicles in one town last week in Ukraine, and we don't even talk about it. They just kept running into the line of artillery fire. They laced mines around the roads so they couldn't go off the roads, so they just kept running right into the same artillery fire. Russia's just bad at this, but we keep spending money over and over again. I think people started to realize that Russia was going to be bad at this a few years ago, and we kind of shifted more to this China as a pacing threat. But I'd really like, that, I wouldn't like to see, but if China were to invade Taiwan, there would certainly be immense consequences for the United States, but China would probably lose over 100,000 troops within eight hours. It would be a devastating conflict. Taiwan would likely survive give or take a nuclear weapon or two. Um, but this idea of Russia or China threatening the United States in war, it hasn't materialized. Now, the United States is not very good at urban warfare. We made very, very poor choices in going to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Actually, we were very successful in war in Iraq during the first stage of the war to get Saddam Hussein out. This is the rest of the war that we didn't do very well at. So, I mean, the question is, where does this leave us? You know, where are we now in terms of the future of warfare? There's a lot of dramatic predictions. There's a lot of fantasies. There's not a lot of reality. And unfortunately for us, and fortunately for Russia and everyone else, cyber operations are not shortcuts for war. I think a lot of people believe technology will sanitize war. 
And that was even a theme of an old Star Trek episode where they had this idea of uh, basically cyber war where they simulated warfare between two warring planets. And basically the idea was that if you lost, you had to go line up and be incinerated. And it was supposed to be more humane. It was supposed to sanitize war. It didn't. And it's not happening now. We're seeing the return, like I said, to human wave attacks, uh, trench warfare. It's devastating. It's horrible. It's going to be generational. And the futurists who, protect, who project that cyber will be the path forward have been dramatically wrong. And we have to ask ourselves why we believe in these futurists. Um, for communications, we have to ask ourselves, how do these communications work? How do these strategies actually work in convincing people to believe what doesn't fit reality? There are a lot of outstanding questions, and that's why I still like cybersecurity, because there are, are a lot of outstanding questions. But I would say the majority of academics and scholars and think tank people working on these topics are dramatically wrong. And that's a tough thing to admit. It's a tough thing to kind of accept that, you know, you spend all this time in D.C., you think D.C. operates in a certain way, and they're leading us down a very, very wrong path. I think cyber is very good as a tool for the state to repress an individual population. It's very good as a tool to keep a population in line. We see that with China, with social contracts and things like that. We see that with Pegasus and zero-click malware. It's not good for war. It's not good for interstate diplomacy. It's not good for communication and signaling. And I think a lot of people have gotten things very, very dramatically wrong. And that leads us to ask this question, why? How do we end up at this point? This isn't new. Uh, my favorite cybersecurity movie, going back to pop culture, is War Games. It's 1983. Uh, it's an incredible movie, and it's still the best movie that articulates what cyber, AI, and nuclear war might look like in this age. And we haven't done better than that. In fact, we've regressed dramatically. Um, the next Fast and the Furious movie, I need to go back through all the Fast and Furious movies and talk about the cyber in all these Fast and the Furious movies. But it's ridiculous. It's just out of control. It's fantasy. It's fake. It doesn't meet reality. So we have to ask, why have we let a fake reality articulate our vision of war? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just a humble, empirical social scientist. But that's why there's room to play in this field, because there are a lot of questions remaining. And the why question is still central to the discourse. So with that, I'll leave it to questions. Thank you. Questions? Questions be live. Avery. Uh, thank you so much. And just a super quick question. Is it okay to tweet about your talk? Oh, sure. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. I didn't take any pictures. Yet. Both of you just said. I was curious, though. So, so on one of your charts, you showed that there were um, at least a handful of cyber attacks or engagements that measured as a five, so they were a little mm -hmm. bit higher. Are those any indication of success um, is the idea here to fire a hundred shots in one lands I mean what what's your take on that that would be the hope I think in some ways but it's dramatically failed you're right though I need to go back and pick out what those fives are um, I'll give you an example though a lot of people had hope for the Viasat attack so Viasat is a satellite internet communications platform that actually a lot of uh, airlines use now. Uh, Viasat was hacked, but they didn't hack the satellite. You can't, it's very difficult to hack a satellite. They hacked the BIOS in the modem. So they basically destroyed the modems that received the satellite signal. So to fix that, you either had to replace the motherboard on that modem or get a whole new modem. Devastating. A bunch of uh, windmill platforms in Germany, I think, went out because of that, because they were controlled in some ways by the internet. 
Um, the problem is a lot of people suggest that this was hugely impactful for the Ukrainian military. Um, they had to revise that assessment because later the Ukrainian military said, well, are you crazy? You think we have that many modems? You think we have these modems and tanks? You know, like, you know, I, I, for some reason, don't ask me why, I watch a lot of camping YouTube and they all have Viasat stuff. And, you know, anytime there's a foggy day, doesn't work. Anytime any speck of dust gets on the receiver, it doesn't work. It's very, very temperamental. So for a government to depend on Biosat as a method of communication would be almost assuredly disastrous without cyber attacks. And the Ukrainian government didn't depend on Biosat. But that was the idea. Even Thomas Ridd, one of the most famous scholars in this field, talked about how that's the... If we didn't have this war, this would be the most impactful cyber attack of the year. We'd be talking about it. It, it didn't do anything. That's the problem, is that when you really break it down, it doesn't do anything. Uh, I had a talk the other day at one of these small DC master's programs. And in that program, there were a bunch of people who work at Cyber Command. And they're very fed up because they're being told by their leaders to find effects. And they can't find effects. And quite often it ends up being like us academics where we're writing our, um, our annual performance review and we're doing our targets for next year. But our targets for next year are the things we've already done this year. That's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're writing down things they've already achieved and then telling the next year that, that it's a success. It's, it's a house of cards. It's a problem. And I don't see why it hasn't fallen apart yet, but people are still chugging along. Maybe they're chugging along for one very important reason. Uh, I do believe that we need cyber defenses. I do believe we need to target the industrial critical infrastructure base. Uh, I said in Canada the other day, a state that can't keep its lights on, that can't keep the schools open, that can't keep its healthcare centers active is not a state. And we need to do that. We need to be worried about protection of the basic core critical infrastructure. Does that mean, though, we need to plan to leverage cyber operations in the context of war? Probably not, because it's a lot cheaper to throw a cruise missile at a communications platform than to hack it and bring it down. It just doesn't work like that. So, K-pop? Do <laughs> you guys like the new in-mix? Are you guys all new genes? What's, what's going on here? I just had I just had a thing to say. Um, I loved your loved your point of maybe Russia is bad at war uh, because uh, which is very which is very which is funny for a personal reason because my grandfather fought in the Hungarian Revolution. Mm -hmm. but, you know, another time when famously the little guys kind of destroyed <laughs> Russia. So the Finns, the Finns killed like what, 150,000 Russians during that winter war? We don't even talk about it. Yeah? Um, I thank you. This was amazing. And your expertise is just so cool to like hear about. It's just completely sort of different and new to me. So that was really cool. Can I quote that? Because I had a job interview <laughs> at, at an Ivy League the other day, and they're like, How do you keep in touch with students? And I said, Well, first off, I don't open a lecture with a Harry Potter reference anymore. It just doesn't work. That's the way yeah. to go. So one thing I was thinking about was I remember a point in the war during which I think it was the Ukrainians who said we have all of this information that we've hacked um, all this information on Russian soldiers and we're going to mm -hmm. like release it right and I guess the question that arises for me is if this is ineffective right if it's ineffective to do all of this hacking if this cyber is sort of overblown right um, it doesn't make sense to me that Ukraine is sort of amplifying that narrative, right? They want it to be out there. Yeah. So the question I have is like, do you have a sense of the Ukrainians or the Russians are the ones coming up with these narratives, right? They may be sort of the ones disseminating these large mm -hmm. narratives about cyber is the future of war, yeah. despite their actions, or do you think this is something that really starts with like popular press picking up these stories and trying to amplify it for the public? Like who's, who's starting? I don't know if I could tell you the either or, but I, what I can tell you is we don't understand advertising. We don't understand influencers, right? Like there, there's no rhyme or reason why one influencer is more popular than another, really. It just, 
I mean, it's like relatability, things like that, but it's stuff you can't quantify. And it becomes very, very difficult to quantify these things. And what you were referring to that actually horrified me. Because what the Ukrainians were saying that they were going to do is that they were going to take video of dead Russian soldiers and send it to their families. And that goes back to what we called back in the war in Afghanistan, the crystal map. And the crystal map, the, the general in charge of the war at the time, was basically saying the reason the war in Afghanistan is so difficult to fight is because during World War I, if you had 10 German soldiers and eight of them are dead, you have two left. In Afghanistan, if you have 10 Afghani soldiers, eight of them are dead, you have 38 now because of clan dynamics and family dynamics. I thought that was a horrible strategy for the Ukrainians because you're activating family and clan dynamics. The other thing we don't talk about is the majority of people fighting for the Russian military are not European stock. They're ethnic minorities. They're clans. And that's the ones fighting, and they're the ones fight, uh, feeling the brunt of this conflict. And it's not a good idea to flaunt dead people in front of their families. You know, they're not happy that they're being made to fight this war, but it's even less easy for them to accept when one of their loved ones comes back dead. And to get a text message on that, that's devastating. And at the same time, in the United States, we don't train, and I, I know this for a fact, we don't train the homeland for how to deal with this. Every wife who's deployed is going to get that text saying your husband's dead. It, it happens to almost all of them. How do you deal with that? What do you do? Who do you call? What is your support network? What do you do if you're not alone and you don't have that you know, mythical sewing circle or whatever? Um, we don't have solutions for the power of information warfare. I think that's where the real battle is, but we make it all this mythical cyber AI quantum stuff. And, you know, it's just, we're just telling a cool story that's like basically akin to talking about a cool car. But the reality of this world is it's much more mundane and it's much more difficult to process how reality works. Like, you know, how does the Instagram algorithm work? And, you know, why am I buying something on Instagram when I've never bought anything on a, a TV ad? You know, those sorts of realities are tough to uncover. And, you know, it goes to show why we're so scared of TikTok, right? Because we don't understand where that data is going. So it's the mysteries of this world that really confuse us. But for me, there's no mystery about cyber war. It's, to me, it's all hype. I know the more cyber operators I know, the more I just call bullshit on them and just say, like, you know, come on. You know, I have a friend, um, not a friend, an ex-friend now, who said that if he had shot three Russians at dinner with him in 2015, we wouldn't have the 2016 election happen. And I would say, well, that would be a messy dinner. You'd probably be in jail. You probably don't want to preemptively kill people. There's a whole minority report idea. But this idea that people are so central to this conflict individuals are so central to this conflict. It, it goes back to this Microsoft being the main character syndrome. They want to be central. And, and sometimes in war, the individual is not central to the war. Right? All the time in war, it's not about the individual. That's why a lot of people don't like, you know, I don't know how I got this handed. They don't like Band of Brothers. Because Band of Brothers and all these TV shows and all these movies are about the individual. And war is about the collective. And that's difficult to deal with. It's difficult to measure. This was fascinating. Thanks. I'm, I'm trying to connect this in my mind to this old idea in calm of the mean world syndrome where we cultivate this idea, the research says through television now, through whatever, that the world's a mean and scary place because we see violence in the, mm -hmm. in the world of media and so forth. And so then it affects our behavior down the line somewhere maybe by an alarm system not because we've ever been the victim of crime, but because we think that the world is dangerous and so we have to do something about it. And so that's, you know, that's a, an irrational behavior based on media consumption because the, the actual fact of the stats is that mm -hmm. it's very unlikely for your house to be burglarized and stuff. Anyway, so, I mean, that to me seems to connect to a broader phenomenon that explains some of what you're talking about and explains a lot of what we experience in the, the world of information dynamics and behavior, which is 
we act in ways that are based on perceptions that have very little to do with the lived experience. I mean, it seems mm -hmm. like military behavior in this case is you know, prepping for a cyber war that's not probably going to come and so forth. So, so all that's fine and good, but is there an extent to which if we stop doing all those things, then there are all these secondary effects that are hard to predict. So if, is there some value, I guess, mm -hmm. in these irrational, but still maybe somewhat functional behaviors? I mean, maybe, maybe we live in a slightly safer world mm -hmm. because lots of people have alarm systems because of this flawed perception mm -hmm. of the world as a scary place. Maybe we live in a slightly safer cyber scenario because everybody's building up their family. I mean, I, that might be a stretch, but I'm curious to hear what you think if there's some positive downstream yeah. effects to some of this irrationality. Well, I can tell you that, yes, there is. And, you know, as skeptical as I seem about all this, I believe in the defense. Now, I believe in the idea that the state must keep the lights running, that they must demonstrate that there is capacity for the state to organize society. And how do you organize and protect society? That's the key question. And quite often, as particularly for the ransomware epidemic we've experienced the last two years during the, the pandemic, uh, the solution is to use the military against those problems. And that just gets to this whole problem of over leveraging the military and uh, make, militarizing the police. And I don't think that's the best solution. The best solution to me is to enable DHS and Health and Human Services to help protect the nation. I think it's moral and right that universities start to develop cybersecurity programs to staff the cyber workforce. I just hope that most people who work in the cyber workforce aren't going to go work for the DOD because everyone else needs uh, cybersecurity support. Under resourced groups need cybersecurity support. We saw a spate of hacks around abortion and this idea that we're going to hack people who got abortions or get the abortion pill. Those things are way more scary than any of these things I'm talking about and more. And that's a problem. And that's a foundation where we're, that, that, that's an issue where we're attacking the foundations of society and the bonds of trust in society. So there is a purpose to all this, but sometimes it goes too far. Um, you know, I can tell you, like I have this Virginia government account that I got locked out of myself because they enforced a change password when I didn't want the password changed. Or my other favorite one was, um, I was adjuncting for American University and they made me change the password in the middle of grading season. And to change the password, I had to find my employee ID and I didn't know where my employee ID was. It's just, we try and make things more secure and in that process, we just end up breaking everything. You know, Tesla's a great example of all that. You know, we, we, we try and, you know, sell this idea of a full automatic drive system and we don't say it's just a beta system. We're just testing it. And we have to admit in reality that a lot of what we're doing here is we're just testing it. But for me, I think the most indicative example goes back to the Simpsons in the 90s. When Homer got too fat to work at the nuclear power plant, they gave him that computer station and they had to press any key to vent the nuclear power plant. And he didn't do it that one time. They almost had a meltdown and, you know, he had to go back to work. That's just the basic lesson we should have learned in the 90s but we still connect everything to the internet. So we saw recently during the Super Bowl in Tampa that someone messed with the water in Tampa and tried to pollute the city with chlorine. There was also an incident where a power plant was attacked from Russia and Washington Post reported it. It turned out someone who worked at the power plant was touring Russia just for a family vacation and logged into work. I don't know why they would do that, Sounds pretty stupid to me, but why should you be able to log into work from, you know, from Russia? That's just, it's insane. We've made things too easy to allow digital access. And this is something we're dealing with in the ramifications of education, right? Everything has become online. Everything has become hybrid. Uh, we use hybrid education to expand enrollment. And next thing you know, you have a lot of people dissatisfied with your educational programs because they're sitting at home and they're not networking and they're not getting the full experience. It's tough. There's, there's no right way to do this, but I can tell you one thing, we're doing it very wrong in cyber war. And I hope that a new field of information operations and information warfare will rise up in its place and do better, but 
I don't know. Maybe we make things worse as academics to, to give us things to do. I don't know. Any final questions? All right. Please join me in thanking Dr. Boyd and